Well, welcome to another edition of MD Insight. I'm delighted to be here today with Daryl Cass. Daryl is a pediatric surgeon here at Cleveland Clinic, and he's director of fetal surgery and our fetal care center. So Daryl, maybe talk a little bit first about why you ended up doing pediatric surgery. It's obviously such a fascinating area, and what, what led you to it? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I always was interested in kids. I was a, a college student at Stanford, and during summers, I would often coach kids in sports camps. I played baseball on the team and, and was involved in sports throughout. And so I entered medical school with the perspective of being interested in kids. And then I learned that there was a specialty, but I also grew up fixing cars. My dad was an auto mechanic. And so I was generally inclined to fixing things. And then I learned in med school that there was this amazing specialty of pediatric surgery, which I felt, I, the second I knew that that was a specialty, it was an immediate match. Um, so that led me to pursuing that field. And you know, we go through the match process and I was you know, very, blessed to have matched at UCSF. And my career trajectory into the world of fetal surgery was pure luck because that was where the birthplace of fetal surgery was. It was essentially pioneered by a guy named Mike Harrison. He was at U, the P, practicing pediatric surgeon at UCSF. He had a great partner, Scott Adzik. And as I was an intern starting out my first month in the service as an intern, finding my way, I met these guys and they were immediately attractive to me. And I guess they thought I was okay, showed some promise as well. And really the rest is history because I then bonded with them, did research with them, spent three years doing research on fetal surgery and fetal tissue repair. And really my career took off from there. Oh, wow, that's quite an amazing story. It's funny in a way how fortuitous it is, people yeah. who we meet through our training and it just redefines our, uh, absolutely. our career path. So pediatric, we may come back to pediatric surgery later on, and obviously that's birth to whatever age you define as adolescence, and it depends on disease process and thing, things like that. But fetal surgery is a little bit more complex. So to those people who may not know as much about fetal surgery, you know, what what is that? What does that encompass? Yeah, I, I would, you know, it, it, it's, the definition has evolved somewhat, but I would just say fetal surgery is essentially doing interventions on the baby before they're actually born. And that could be either in the middle of their development or it can be right at the end of their development, right before birth. And it's just doing interventions that are designed to try to improve their outcome. And it is a newer field because it, it's dependent upon our ability to see inside the uterus with imaging, and that's relatively new. Ultrasound really only got developed in the 70s. It, the technology has continually improved. OB ultrasound became more used in the 80s. A fetal MRI uh, at first was very cumbersome and involved having to paralyze the fetus because it took, the studies took too long. But as the technology got better and better, our ability to diagnose and see inside the uterus has only gotten better and better. And then we begin to correlate what we're seeing before birth with what the outcome of those babies were after birth. And then we started to conceive of interventions that we can do to try to optimize their outcome. In, in the most dramatic examples, uh, the fetus dies before birth um, because they have some kind of birth defect and, and, it, and it leads to deterioration and, and they die unless we try to do something. But now we're kind of in an era that's really, really interesting moving into the future of trying to improve long-term outcome where it isn't life or death necessarily, but we're talking about doing interventions to improve how that baby is five years down the road or 10 years down the road or even 50 years down the road. Well, we may talk about some, well, we will talk about some of the conditions in a second, but so this is not just surgery, obviously. It takes quite a multidisciplinary team. You talked about imaging, but what, what other kind of specialists are involved and, and are part of the overall fetal care program team? That's, that's exactly right. Uh, these are complex teams um, and it involves expertise in lots of different levels. Pediatric, uh, fetal imaging, which can be done by an obstetrician or it can be done by a radiologist, a pediatric radiologist. Fetal MRI are critical elements. 
Um, and then uh, mater our maternal fetal medicine partners. So those are obstetricians that then subspecialize in maternal fetal medicine fellowship, and they become expert in managing moms with disease or fetuses with disease are absolutely, those are our partners in this whole field. And depending on what we're treating or how we're treating it, um, it depends on kind of which, it's a collaborative effort, but sometimes we're treating problems of the placenta that affect twin pregnancies, for example. And that disease tends to be more focused on by the maternal fetal medicine specialist. But then other times we're treating diseases that we commonly treat as pediatric surgeons or urologists or neurosurgeons, such as spina bifida, diaphragm hernia. And, and those become more of a collaborative effort with all of our pediatric partners uh, involved in those specialties. So you named a couple of them, but so there's, so what, what are some of the big disease groups or conditions that you end up treating? Obviously, congenital diaphragmatic hernia is a big one because you're trying to allow the lungs form before birth. Yeah. What, what other kind of big groups for people who might not know as much about the field? Well, a, a common one currently is, is spina bifida, myelomeningocele. That's a severe birth defect of the spine where the spinal cord elements are exposed out into the uterine environment. And we've learned with careful study that there seems to be progressive damage that can happen to that spinal cord. And we see the fetus have deterioration in function because of that. And we've proven that doing a repair of that problem before birth improves their long-term outcome. Um, another common condition is called twin-twin transfusion, which is a problem of the placenta for uh, monochorionic diamniotic twins. Okay. Um, and the problem is they share blood vessels. And uh, the best treatment for that condition is actually to do laser photocoagulation of those communicating blood vessels. And that was also tested with a prospective randomized trial that proved the benefit of that compared to other ther therapies that we can do. And you mentioned diaphragm hernia. Um, currently, that actually remains, that's a very exciting uh, area of, and it's one that I'm particularly interested in moving to the future, but currently it is still experimental. Um, there are two random prospective randomized trials that are ongoing currently in European centers where we're studying fetoscopic endotracheal occlusion, where we, we use, put a little scope into the uterus and we deploy a balloon in the trachea and that balloon blocks the trachea. The lungs make fluid during their development and by blocking that fluid egress, the lungs actually blow up, pressure builds up in the lungs and that helps the lungs grow and expand, we think. Uh, but we're testing that compared to not doing that before birth. And I believe we're going to have some answers from those trials in the next year or two. And uh, we here at the Cleveland Clinic are excited to begin participating in all of those therapies. Yeah, yeah, it's very exciting. And so then the, the treatments that you do, depending on the conditions, the techniques you also do are pretty cool. So some of it you go transuterine and some yeah. of it you'll open the uterus. Do you want to talk a little about the different approaches? Because it's so exciting. And Technically phenomenal, actually. Yeah, there's, there's cool different things we can do. Uh, sometimes we can do interventions that are purely ultrasound guided. So the mom can just get a little sedation, local anesthesia, and use ultrasound and put a needle in or put a shunt in uh, through a needle, like a trocar needle system, a Selvinger type technique, where we decompress fluid that's accumulating in the bladder and the chest and the abdomen sometimes, and that can help improve outcome or rescue babies that might be suffering for a particular condition. And then we do fetoscopic procedures, and the, the twin twin transfusion is an example of that, where we put a single trocar in through the mom's skin into the uterine cavity, and then we put a little scope in, the, the camera goes in, we can see the baby, we can see the anatomy, and then we can put a laser fiber in and use that to coagulate vessels. Uh, or that's how we would put a little balloon into the fetus's trachea to occlude the trachea for diaphragmatic hernia, for example. And then, uh, you know, and then we can do fetoscopic surgery, um, other types of fetoscopic surgery. In fact, there's a, an investigation that we're going to be starting soon to try to fix gastroschisis. Um, 
because we've gotten better at fetoscopic interventions, the problem with gastroschisis is the bowels are out in the amniotic con contents, caught, they get damaged, sometimes it can even be a lethal problem. And the concept is to maybe fetoscopically go in and carefully put the bowel back in and try to close up the defect well before birth to try to allow that bowel to recover and limit its damage. And that's like a real cool concept of, of, how, of kind of where we're headed, I think, in the future as we've gotten better and more experience with this. Open surgery is, is the most dramatic. And that's you know what people have seen on the internet where we have to open the mom up, there's the pregnant uterus. We open the uterus up very carefully, and then we expose the baby. There's, you know, the hand comes out, um, which we use to put a pulse ox monitor on the fetus that helps monitor the heart rate and the well-being. And then we can do different types of surgeries. Spina bifida repair is one of those surgeries. Um, I have experience resecting sacrococcygeal teratomas or resecting uh, pulmonary malformations that are filling up the entire chest of the fetus and they're squishing the heart. And if you don't do anything, the fetus can die. But instead we do a fetal thoracotomy, we remove the tumor, close things up, and then allow the baby to recover. And remarkably, those kinds of interventions work. And the fetus can be born and can be completely normal, like can develop normal, play t-ball. I saw one fetus that had that was dying from a tumor with high output physiology. And I saw her at four years of age, hula hooping and singing karaoke to Taylor Swift at the same time while she was hula hooping. And actually it brought tears to my eyes because it was so amazing. Because I, I recall vividly yeah, operating sure. on her yeah. when she was 24 weeks developed. Uh, that's truly quite incredible. Remarkable yeah. stories and remarkable techniques. Uh, thank you. I mean, this insight is fantastic. I've certainly found it interesting, and I knew a little bit about the field already. How do people get in touch? Is it should they talk to their OB, or do they contact us or the program or you directly? Or I mean, what would you tell people who aren't sure what to do and have conditions they're worried about? Yeah, uh, the best way to contact us would be to reach out to call the number of our fetal care center. We have amazing uh, nurse coordinators, Carrie Budzar, Sue Grzynski. And our newest member, Sandra Keene, uh, they will answer the phone and answer any questions, and they'll start the process of, of creating a consultation or an evaluation. And, and we're happy to do whatever is necessary simply to help. Um, it, it could be a phone call if a family is interested in information. It could be I can provide recommendations, you know, depending on where they live. Yeah. If there's more a closer uh, centers that might be appropriate. But of course, we're happy to help in any way that, that works for any, any family or any referring provider. Super. Well, Daryl, thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking time to talk today. Thank you.